as people join in, I'm just going to give a quick introduction. Um, so about the talks, uh, this is, it's called the Matra, the Unplugged Life Talks by Matra. And um, the reason we are doing this is to kind of go behind the scenes, talk to some of our creatives from the country and hopefully beyond as well. Um, but not talk to them about their work or their projects. That's something that we see rather often. It's something that we can find online um, and is rather accessible. But what we want to do is we want to kind of dig behind, uh, peel off the surfaces a little bit and find out what actually makes these guys tick. Uh, we've already had one conversation with Amrish Arora of Studio Lotus. Today, we've got with us Akshat Pat of Architecture Discipline. Welcome, Akshat. Hi. Thank you for taking out your time. And um, on behalf of Matra Architects, I welcome everybody else on Instagram Live and on Zoom. Um, this is an initiative by Matra, and um, which is kind of um, thought of by Virain, who's also here with us today. Virain, would you like to say something? Hi. Yes, I'm very glad that we have today Akshat. Akshat is a very dear friend. I know him for more than 20 years now. And um, we chose him, I think today, uh, Mirnali will say more about it, but we chose him today because I consider him among the most talented young uh, architects and designers. In his case, one should use the word designer besides architecture because his real, his profile of work is extraordinary and surpasses even architecture. And uh, I'm very glad to have him that he agreed. And uh, I'm expecting a lot of provocative conversation today. Okay, so um, just before we start, I'm going to introduce Akshat. It's, um, I've, like Virain said that he's known him for more than 20 years. I've known him for almost 20 years, I would say. And it's an interesting story because I started architecture school in Delhi. I had just joined college and Akshat had just graduated. And he came back as faculty. And that's something that I would want to also get into later. But um, when Akshat came back as faculty, you know, we, all, we have all kinds of faculty, right? You have the ones that you love, the ones that you don't like very much, the ones that you're indifferent to. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to take the liberty of being rather honest and candid in this conversation because I do consider him a friend now. Now, um, he wasn't my favorite person. But I also have to say that um, there was always this, this enigma that surrounded him. And um, that enigma was very clearly that came from a certain sort of proficiency and capacity to, to embody what he believed in and the work that he did as an architect and as a de designer that Virain mentioned. And um, so besides having been taught by him in first year of college, I, was, I also ended up working uh, with him for a short uh, summer break before I went off to university. Um, where we literally sat in one little garage and, you know, I was doing drawing after drawing for him, which he still holds against me today. Um, I hope you haven't dug out those elevations, right? The right here. You it's better not. For, <laughs> <laughs> it's waiting for the moment. <laughs> okay, so um, that's a little bit of a brief and I think um, I'm really happy to have uh, Akshat here today. So while he used to give us homework and give us all these crazy deadlines in college, the minute we decided to invite him for this chat, I found an opportunity to give him a task, uh, something that I'd been waiting for for the last 20 years. So I told Akshar to write a little bit about himself, which I think is one of the hardest things one can do. And I'm gonna read out what he's written. He says, I've been studying architecture since 1997. My interest first peaked when I stumbled upon the works of Coop Blau and then later the four big British architects, Fosters, Rogers, Hopkins, and Grimshaw. I went on to get a professional degree in architecture and over the years cemented my beliefs on progress, optimism, sustainable development, and a strong work ethic. Parallelly, I realized my attitude to music and my quest for progressive expression was being shaped by my engagement with the guitar as a musical instrument, which I began to study in 1993. The pursuit for the holy grail on strings led me to procure guitars, amplifiers, and devices, enough to fill a small house, he says. I am not a collector, I am a player and a tinkerer. Playing the guitar led me to progressive rock and metal music, which in turn, I believe, shaped my socio-political views. If I had to grade you, Akshat, I'd say you did pretty well on this one. Mm -hmm. But I want to start by asking you about your music. Everyone knows you as an architect, as a designer, 
but there is this other sort of personality that sits within you who is a diehard fan of guitars and um, we'd like to know a little bit more about that. How did that start? Well, um, it actually, it, it's strange how some parts of your life are so clear, right? I was, I remember I was 13, we had just got, uh, we just got cable TV at home and we'd got cable TV with the excuse of watching CNN coverage for the Gulf War or something like that. What and, year was um, this? Must have been, I think 92 or 91. Okay. And, you know, um, it was all regimental and like we were, we were not allowed to watch anything else. Hmm. So I think around 92, 93, I came back home and there was no one around and I slipped in MTV. And the hmm. first song I saw or the first, the first scene I saw was actually Slash playing in front of the church. Um, and, you know, like sort of the wind blowing towards him along with the dust. And he was playing the solo for November Day and it was... Uh, I never heard music like that before. You know, I'd heard a little bit of Queen and whatnot at home, but I'd never heard, I'd never heard proper, at that time. Something that intense. Yeah, it, it, was in, yeah. it was intense. And I think I, uh, and that got me started, right? The, my dad just played the guitar, so I, uh, I, I pulled his guitar out of the attic and started learning. And then I started on Quest for a good teacher. Um, and found a couple of guys to teach me. Uh, hmm. One thing led to the other, and um, I, you know, I realized uh, many things happened in between. But it was, it was, you know, playing the guitar was a good place to be when you're 13 and you're in, you're in, uh, you're in high school. Of uh, course. It opened out many other opportunities, and um, well, yeah, that that's it. And then I think practicing sometimes. I mean. I didn't have to study because I didn't have to study. Uh, it's not, it wasn't that difficult to do what we had to do in high school. So I was, uh, I found myself stumbling upon, stumbling onto more, uh, more technical genres like, you know, progressive metal, thrash metal, uh, progressive jazz, some uh, Mahavishnu orchestra, I, I remember. And I, you know, I, and it was, it was suddenly a lot more intense than, than Guns N' Roses. And in order to play that stuff, I had to practice, I had to sit at the edge of my bed and practice maybe 18 to 20 hours a day. And I did that for seven years. This was while you were in school? This was while I was in school. And I How was did you manage school? I think till, I think except calculus and chemistry, um, everything else was easy. Hmm. So then you, know, you would say I, that you're I a bright. Just, yeah, I seem to have dropped <laughs> off Instagram now. Oh, okay. Uh, Is it your connection? It might just be. Just give me a second. Sure, I'll take it down. Connect to. I'll try and connect the Instagram to the Wi-Fi as well. This is just uh, another announcement for the people on Instagram Live. There is a time uh, limit to these live videos, which is 60 minutes. Um, and we don't have a restriction on the kind of uh, conversation that we're having. So in case we cross 50, uh, 60 minutes, the live feed will shut down, but we will start it again. So be patient with us. If it drops, we'll come back online. So a Actually, couple of people saying no audio on, um, on Instagram. Uh, is it better now? Can you hear me, Ashmit? You said no audio. Sunit, you said no audio as well. Uh, I'm being told that I'm audible, but Akshat is not. Okay. So what does Akshat have to do to be audible? Guys, just give us a second. It's a little bit of a challenge because these two platforms are very different. Um, so audio is better what on about? Zoom. One of the reasons it's better on Zoom is because we're connected directly to Zoom and Instagram is... Uh, Sort of like a secondary stepchild, but um, okay, better now, guys. You are both audible, Ashwin says. Okay. Oh, great. Okay, cool. So we are back. Perfect. Okay, we're back. So yeah. Uh, so you were managing school and music, and but obviously your interest in music was just phenomenal, right? At that point. Yeah, I think I think the no matter how much people curse it, if you were listening to mainstream rock and metal at that time, <laughs> it was where you wanted to be. I mean, there was Queensryche, which had released an album called Operation Mindcrime, which was about, you know, the, well, it was socio-political, then 
Steve Vai had formed a new band called Vai and they released an album called Sex and Religion. And I, mm-hmm. Sex and Religion was, you know, I used to have a music system that had a wake up timer. So my alarm was the first song from Sex and Religion, which was, well, the, the first sound at Sex and Religion was glass shattering. And then a guy goes into like this crazy blood curling scream. Uh, uh, and it starts with a song called Here and Now, right? So mm-hmm. Here and Now was... Uh, so that was my wake up. And it's a it's a very loud, very it was an insane song. And I um, still and the and go the third song is a song where Devin Townshend screams to at such a high pitch and for so long that he actually passes out. Like the blood goes to the head, and he passes out, and that's actually on the album. All that's happening. There were insane stuff. Like the Black Crows were playing. The Black Crows, if anyone's heard them, had a song called Remedy. And just before it started, you would hear, you know an insane thing crashing into, like metal crashing. You couldn't figure what the sound was in a studio. It was actually them driving their sound and throwing a mic into a dumpster and driving their sound engineer's car into that. So there was all sorts of insanity. <laughs> it was, it was, uh, and you were just floored by this. Like music just kind of yeah, so took, it took was over. Free. Yeah, it was free. It was free and it, was, it wasn't just free as irresponsible free. I mean, let's not forget the music I was listening to and playing could not have been played under intoxication i mean you had to be right. on your on top of your game at every level so uh, i uh, and by the way that's where nobody knows that where, where i stole architecture discipline from i stole the name or the genesis of architecture discipline came from a video tutorial called rock discipline by john petrucci who would mm-hmm. actually the, and the video started with an hour and a half of stretching exercises before you actually started playing uh, so until today before and you commit, mentioned that you do this as well yeah yeah, I I need to do that. Otherwise, you cramp up. Mm. Uh, I've tried it, and I've, I've so I'm not a bonfire strummer, right? I I've never been into that. I can't play Happy Birthday on the guitar. <laughs> I can I can play the pants of a lot of things, but I can't play Happy Birthday on the guitar. So, but tell me something. If you were so crazy about <clears> the guitar <throat> and you had this sort of this passion, this burning fire, and you were doing it, I mean, the fact that you were practicing 17 to 18 hours a day. Why don't we see you as a guitarist today? Why are we sitting over here talking to you as an architect? So um, in the 90s, you know, the th- and things are always bracketed. In the, in the 90s, there were more, things were even more straight jacketed. I think there was no real, there was no independent music really. The only way you could do music in India was either go to Bollywood. Uh, mm-hmm. And I did have offers for that or uh, at that time. Um, I rec- and, but, it was always just like safe, like get a degree. I wanted to be an architect. Let's not, I know two ways about it. Since I was 13, I wanted to be an architect. I mean, that's well recorded, right? well documented. Now, people have asked me and I've said, you know, how I got inspired to be an architect. It was only to collect stationery. Uh, but it was, it was a thing to do, right? That, uh, because A, it didn't, I didn't have to pass my board exams. I mean, I would mm-hmm. just have to pass. I didn't really have to study. Well, yeah. uh, so that's what I was geared for. And, you know, it was like, get a degree. You know, get a degree and then do what you want. You know what, Akshat, most people, when they say get a degree, they go to DU, do three years and they're done with it. And you, of all things, chose to do a five-year professional course, which is really not the easiest of the lot. It, or convenient for that matter, right? It's not convenient, yes. Um, so my question being is that what made you, if you had the choice, you were clearly good in music, you enjoyed it, you were spending that kind of time doing it and you were dedicated to that particular field um you were obviously fascinated by architecture and i think it'd be worth sharing that story of when you kind of went and met your uncle and you kind of fell in love with the idea of it um but still why you know okay why don't you tell us that story and then maybe it'll be clearer to people why you chose one over the other so well it was a well the story of my becoming an architect started about the same time you know Hmm. my house was under construction my mother was in uh in london she was studying, so I was um, I was alone with my father, and we had a couple of dogs, right? So I would, we would be taken. Evening was time spent with my father, so and I remember one day he took me to my uncle's house, and it was an it's an apartment in um, it was a newly done apartment at that time in Alaknanda, and he was the chief architect at um, uh, Satish Gujral's office, and you know he was and he was working on the plans to our house, uh, to the extension of our house, and. Um, which is where I was going to live. And uh, when I walked in and he was, you know, he was like a tall, good looking guy, you know, mm. salt and pepper hair, salt and pepper beard and uh, soft spoken and had a, you know, every move he made, even on the dining table, like considered move, like a 
the way he'd sort of pick up every morsel and sort of uh, well, just his mannerisms were just were 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 so unique and uh, soft and gentle and precise. It was you couldn't help but fall in love with him. And when I so when I went to his house one evening to review the drawings to our uh, for our house, and I mean not review, I didn't understand anything. As when my dad said, you know, come along. Uh, otherwise, you'll just order pizzas and hot chocolate fries and noodles. So <laughs> I went, you know, and I saw him uh, sitting on the ground. As you enter, mm. there was a little niche in his house, and he was on the ground. And uh, there was this A naught drawing board covered with those days blueprints and you know, mm. laminated blueprints with a very heavy parallel bar. And the parallel bar was probably one that he had fashioned himself <laughs> because I've never seen a parallel bar like that since. The heavy, wide parallel bar and he was drawing out these plans on like a sort of silk fabric of sorts. I've never seen that. I have, I have those plans. I still don't know what it is. Yeah, he was drawing on fabric. Hmm. Um, and he was drawing on fabric with, of course, technical hmm. pens, but he was also right. filling it in with technical pens. And the colors were flat primary colors, right? But like you're using, a, like you would use a marker, but these were wider and you could sure. mix colors and all. I just fell in love with the stationery. I said, hmm. I want that. And, and of course, there were like very complicated sextants and compasses and dividers mm. and all kinds of things. I said, I want that. And uh, it's, it's very expensive stationery. So I said, yeah, yeah, sure, you'll get it when, and you have to know how to use it, right? You can't fill any key point <laughs> for that. So I said, well, you have to become an architect for it. So I just went home and I declared to my grandfather that, you know, I'm going to be an architect. And then it stayed. And then I think they were excited about it. So they all found out you know, what does he need to do to be an architect? And that, and I got to know that I didn't really have to study. That meant, I mean, all I had to do was pass an aptitude test with drawing and whatnot. And till I was uh, about 10 years old, I used to get good grades in art and drawing and whatnot. So I thought, yeah, I could do it when I was younger. So I'm sure I can do it now. And it gave me reason to, um, it gave me an excuse to just play the guitar. So I would listen to more music and uh, mm. and go out and play. And I would I would be, playing with my band till 12 o'clock at night and I come back home and still be, you know, playing quietly in my bedroom and, you know, fall off to sleep maybe three, four in the morning and go back to school at eight. So that was in school, but I mean, that's a, a, a hefty price to pay to, uh, you know, to get a degree and that also architecture. And you obviously, you figured that you didn't have to study in school to get into architecture, but what happened once you did get into architecture? What happened when you were in college? Were you able to still dedicate that much time to your music? Uh, well, in the first year, yes. So in the first year, actually, I worked on an, I, I, by the time I got into, into architecture school, I was already playing with, uh, I was already playing in studios and I was playing live uh, gigs. Now, okay. I was disenchanted by the You had a gigs. band, right? I had a couple of bands, yes. Okay. Like, I had a couple of bands and I was, the, I, 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 by the way, I've uploaded some of my guitars on my B-Takes Pictures uh, Instagram yeah. account. And there was, a, there was a Czech guitar, a played guitar, which it's called the played guitar. It was played by a guy called Bruce Saraceno. It's called played because it's got Scottish Czechs, not because it's not, it's P-L-A-I-D, not P-L-A-Y-E-D. And I used to sort of walk around in the open with it. And those days you would, mm, I, you would either, I think those days you'd either have a Maruti 800 or you'd have to take an auto. That's the only way you'd get around. Now choose to take the auto because that means everyone, you would see my guitar. Oh. It was, it was <laughs> an enviable guitar, right? And I would get compliments for it, of course. But and um, but I was so I was playing. I was playing progressive instrumental music on the guitars. I was playing things like, um, for the love of God and Liberty by Steve Vai, which mm. are very very complex pieces. You know, they're anthems, but they're complex pieces. And I would and find technical. Very technical, like hmm. super technical. I can't play it now. Uh, and, you know, Dream Theater uh, also. And uh, so Dream Theater is sort of is progressive metal with vocals, but, you know, still. And I would find people headbanging in front of me as if I was playing Metallica or Slayer, you know, which is it's good music. It's, you know, there is, a, again, there's a difference between music for art and music for music, musicianship, right? And I was doing that. And I would find the audience head banging. So basically, it, they didn't get it. They got the image of the rock star or the, or the rock musician, but they didn't get the music. Uh, so I said, quickly, I have to get out of here. You know, and, or, I can't do this anymore. And 
it's 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 not like there were like clear cut divisions, right? But I was disenchanted with playing live in India. It was anyway terrible sound and terrible whatnot. But I and I met a guy uh, who asked me to start working for a music channel, which was MTV at the time. But by the time I started working with them, they became Channel V. Mm. Um, and I recorded for a couple of albums. I met one of my best friends there uh, while I was recording an album with uh, in uh, in the in a newly made studio for 20th Century Fox. It was called USL Studios. So he spent about two weeks doing that. The same as Butter. No, it's it was no. It was run by the same guy who okay. we did uh, who I did Butter for. And Butter mm. was my first project after architecture school. And I'm going to uh, slip that in. I made as well drawings for Butter. <laughs> Which I which I still can't find. Oh great! <laughs> it was orange all, and blue. All hand drawn, huh? Yes. <laughs> it was orange and blue, and it was made from a studio that was red and black. Mm. It was called Demonk, which was Manu yes. and me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I was one of your first employees. You were, you were the you were the first and only employee. Oh really? Didn't know about the only part of things. No, I think. Yeah, I think was there one more for a short while? Who was a graphic designer? Mm-hmm. But that's it. Um, so it's kind of like starting out from a garage, and um, uh, yeah, and and so when I I spent two weeks recording in the most expensive studio in the country, mm-hmm. and it was uh, and then a month mastering it, right? And unfortunately, recording in India at that time was a very very clinical process, right? You had to, and and uh, we were on. We were on. We were not recording on tape. We were recording on computers already. But it was there was something that it, there was what 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 I think what I realized at that time was that if I have to make a living through music, be it live or in the studio, I would mm-hmm. have to. I would have to. I would have to sort of dilute myself as a musician and an artist to do so. so it could not be pure. But it if you felt commercial. so, but if you felt so strongly about it, did you never consider like moving out, going abroad, or just taking that, like taking that passion and doing something with it? Um, you, you know, I don't think you think that far. Yeah, uh, I, oh. I was by then I was already in architecture school. I have always been averse. I don't know why. I was. I've <laughs> always been averse to <clears throat> going abroad. Uh, <laughs> and so you uh, tried convincing me once. Not to go to university. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So yeah, I've I've never been for it. I've never figured it. Um, and there was a lot of opportunity here, and and mm. I was committed to being in you know at TVB. I liked it. I enjoyed it. I had mm. friends, and uh, and by the way, I was at TVB because I was promised a new guitar every year. You know, I had, I got into SEPT and I got into TVB, and as my father was driving me at that time to buy to you know buy my wardrobe for hostel. He said, "You know, listen. If you're my only kid, if you stay, I get your guitar. You're I'm gonna stay. <laughs> so I stayed, and and I, and I think which uh, was the other thought, place where you were going otherwise? Sept. Well, Sept. Okay. Sept and Abadia. And, and I think we were. <clears throat> um, I think you think it was, was a good decision. I do. I do. I do. Yeah. Is I, that where I your have, collection started from? Well, I managed to acquire <coughs> three guitars." A Marshall amplifier and a couple of processors. So yeah, not bad for that time. Yeah. And no can we can we tell our uh, humble audience what we've gathered or how we've kind of uh, enhanced the collection since? Oh yeah, sure. You can go ahead and tell them. <laughs> so no, I I wouldn't know the details, but Akshay's got what seventy odd guitars now. Yeah. And I've got seventy guitars. I've got lots of. I've got lots of. Uh, I've got a few really good amplifiers, uh, lots of pedals, lots of processors, all kinds of stuff. I mean, it's enough to, yeah, it's enough to fill a small apartment and and more. Uh, so much so that they're all not in one place. And I have to say, I have an enviable collection. I mean, if I was not me, I would envy myself. I, I would envy my collection. Well, I'm it's, sure it's really there are good. lots of people out there who feel that way right now. Maybe, How much yeah. stationery have you collected since? Oh, a lot. <laughs> but uh, but I've, I've I've now decided to become a stationery minimalist since I hardly really? use it. Yes. So mm. and now that we're basically relegated to an iPad and an mm. Apple Pencil. So over the last year, um, 
I've just been giving stationery away to people like not use stationery, but new really nice stationery to everyone in the studio. So yeah, as a you know uh, as an occasion treat and general, or as a as a shabash, you get something. I really hope that this interview is, is uh, extremely engaging and exciting. I will be there to collect my. Uh, yes, it really, really depend on the questions you ask and what you reveal. So far. You're, <laughs> So far, I'm doing okay. <laughs> yeah, so far you're all right. <laughs> well, let's um, let's change that a little bit. Then. <laughs> I want to understand from you. Like, did you ever find it disappointing? I mean, you said that you were a little disenchanted by the, the music scene in Delhi, uh, in India. Um, you know, you had various offers. You were doing really well in that mm-hmm. aspect of things. You moved to architecture. You obviously, and um, you know, we've talked about this earlier. So that, that your your practice of music but did you never feel that you know the disappointment that you faced in music you could also face in anything else so is that a way of kind of you know denying yourself something that you want to do no i i i feel that i have um, i feel i feel not doing it or sort of keeping music to myself has allowed me to keep it pure. So I don't, I've, you know, I, I start feeling like I'm not a puppet and I'm not a bard. You know, that's how I felt when I finished. And if I want to play, like, you know, it, ha- it is visceral, right? It is emotive. So, so you may not be expressing your emotion verbally, uh, but you're, but you're, but it's expressing, you're expressing on your instrument and you can't, you're not you're not doing that to for, for people to clap. Hmm. You, you may do it for appreciation, or at least I would may do do it for appreciation. But if you want to be successful commercially in music, if you want to make a living from it, not about commercial, if you want to make a living, you're going to have to compromise. Hmm. So I never did, and then and over time, and and I think I, my last session was at Butter, uh, or maybe after. Maybe flow. It was my last session was maybe was well after was a couple of years after I started architecture discipline, because but I was only doing sessions with a few people, a few hmm. dear friends, and once right. in a while like oh you're sitting in the studio oh we need this or you know hey I'll wing it you know just for the hell of it, um, because you won't depend on it. So there was freedom right in in what I do, and that's it's it's still that way. It's not like I can't play, I can still play well. I can't play as well as I used to. I can't play as well as I want to. I still play hmm. well. And, and and when I play, it has to be really loud because I have non-master volume amplifiers. So, you know, a full Marshall, like when I play at home, then a lot of people can hear me, right? So it's a, you know, these are amplifiers that never were meant to be turned down. They're just full volume valve amplifiers. So, um, so I play for myself and, and I enjoy it because that's, that's uh, almost like meditation or cathartic to me. It's not... Mm. Uh, it's not meant for anyone else. It's not meant for anyone to appreciate or like. It's just meant for me to appreciate or like, and it's what I do. So I, while I was, you know, um, there was a time when I was basically just playing the acoustic guitar and playing sort of uh, resonant guitar, uh, you know, well resonant chords and just sort of enjoying myself with that. Sometimes I was just droning on the guitar. Uh, a couple of years ago, I discovered a metal form called Gent, and I was playing. I was playing a lot of Gent. is very very heavy. Music and yeah. I started enjoying Gent. I uh, two years ago I started I trying. I start. I picked up a, a two eight string guitars and I started playing Ace, which is even lower and heavier and sort of deeper and darker music. But it um, it's freedom and I don't want to give that up. Uh, I wouldn't. I, I'm happy to share. I, I think I've come to a place in my mm-hmm. life and I'm happy to share my collection of music and my collection of guitars. So I have a separate Instagram account where I put out obscure. Uh, music that I uh, yeah. that I hear and from bands that most people which are not mainstream but I think are really impressive I make my connections but I it's it's pure and I and I think for the longest time architecture was supposed to be that as well yeah I was going to ask because I mean all your creative expression right has with music it's kind of become private and you've pulled it into your own space but architecture is also your cre- creative expression and that's something that you are now engaging the public with mm-hmm. but doesn't it hold the same risks doesn't it have the same values at the end of the day where 
you are making compromises. You're not doing it for yourself. You're not necessarily doing things that, um, you know, you want to do, or you might, you might still be doing things you want to do, but it's still driven by a lot of external factors and agents. So are you saying that it's, it's okay to do it like that in one and not in the other? Or was it just easier to keep music to yourself? I think it was easier to keep music to myself and it became that. Mm. Um, architecture, well, I had to earn a living. And, um, and, I, and I care for architecture. I, I love it. I mean, I, I got hooked onto architecture when I saw Coop Kimmel Blouse work. So, so for right. the first year in architecture school, I was just getting bored making these 10, 12, 14 feet orthogonal things, studying vernacular structure, saying, what is this? You know, because in music, we had gone, while I owned classical, well, classic instruments from the 60s and 70s, I was never into classic rock. I mean, I can listen to a Led Zeppelin song, but I, you know, it's, it's not, it's not moving beyond. But then now when you listen to guys like Stephen Wilson or Guthrie Govan or Pliny or, uh, you know, animals without, uh, animals as leaders and whatnot, you, you realize that that's very different music. And I was, I was searching for that in architecture, which I didn't find the first year. Uh, but, uh, in, and in the second year, I remember it was Aruna who said, go to the bloody library, you know, second, first, first week of second year, you said go to the library. And I, I, that was the first time I walked in the library and I walked in and, and I remember like I had, I had spent a lot of time with my grandfather sitting at the India International Center Library and reading the Encyclopedia Britannica. So hmm. I was kind of done with libraries. Uh, but when he sent me in there, because he, he, I, he almost kind of gave me that look, so I'm going to flunk you if you don't. So I went and I stumbled upon a book, like the big book, uh, the big hardbound book. I don't know what may have been like a croquis or an AD monogram or something. And I saw uh, the rooftop extension by Coop Himmel on the cover. And that was it. Like that was virtuosity in architecture. And I say, if, if people can do that and that exists, then I want to do whatever they're doing. And that's how that started. And that got me hooked. And I, I think for the first, for the longest time, I, uh, we, I think till about 2000, 15 till we did 15 or 16 till we did the India Pavilion, we were in a very enviable place because we were not ever pushed on by clients. We could do what we mm. wanted to do. We would pick. We we never. I never wanted to be a commercial studio. Uh, I wanted to be a mainstream studio, mm. and I don't think anyone can say they don't want to be mainstream. Whatever you do, you need sure. have it seen. <clears throat> but when we were doing the Discovery Center and Ranakpur and 53 and even the India Pavilion, we weren't getting pushed around. We were doing what we wanted to do. Um, mm. And it's only then, maybe 2016 or something, we said, hey, we need to get a couple of clients who can challenge us in challenge us be a certain point, which is when we started uh, doing, and, and we realized that there was really that, that challenge in like, you were working at a certain scale in architecture. Um, there, that challenge really didn't exist in unless you start, you went to some very specific people. It wasn't doctor, it's not strategized, but it was just like, ah, oh, you know, it's getting too easy. Can we make it a little more difficult for ourselves? But that seems to be like a recurring theme in yeah. your life, right? Like Masoch masochism. <clears throat> yeah, I, I was not going to say that, but you did. <laughs> but this whole idea of, you know, you're trying different things and then you feel that, oh, this is, it's too, too easy. I want to do something more. So you have this constant need to challenge yourself, right? But would you say that you also strive for perfection? Or is that something? Uh, well, you could, you could, you could <clears throat> say, I, people tell me I'm a perfectionist, but I know I'm not perfect. So I don't know what that means. I mean, I'm told often that I'm, but I say, no, I, 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 uh, and you can ask the studio guys, right? I would say, stop, don't do any more often enough. But mm. that's just so, right? Don't push it to an esoteric point where no one gets it and no one understands it. We still do it. We still push things to a certain point where no one gets it. And that's your learning. That's your deconstruction. But do you do that with music as well? Do you no. ever tell yourself that, okay, this is enough and I'm going to stop now? No. Why not? Why because the distinction me, between your two creative expressions? Because architecture has to manifest itself and <clears throat> last beyond you. Mm. It has to last beyond me. That's last, and it's not necessarily that a strong design or a strong design statement will last forever. Mm. It's a strong design for the moment. 
right? So you do need to temper your architectural emotions to, to last beyond a couple of generations. So you need to temper them. It's not mm-hmm. set design. So maybe if I was a set designer or a theater designer or, you know, doing a little object, like, you know, maybe even a piece of furniture, you could do so. But mm. most architecture, for the, for the kind of work we do beyond, besides the homes, you have to, and even homes for that matter, need to last a couple of generations. Now? But that's in what you construct and what you build, right? But in um, what I'm also mean to ask is that um, when you talk about music and you talk about playing the guitar, that's a very personal exercise for you, right? And that's mm-hmm. why you don't put that restriction on yourself. In, instead, what you're doing is you're putting immense ex- expectations and pressure on yourself to perform in a certain way. And the only judge of that performance is you yourself. Um, in architecture, why do we feel that we are, I understand the context and I understand that we've got this responsibility and everything, but why do we allow ourselves to hold back in our design process? So even um, there, like the, the, you know, the personal journey can still be, or can still strive for that. No, or so do we, we do, do that? We, we I, I, I believe we do. Mm-hmm. In this, in, in, at architecture discipline, I believe we do. Um, and there are, there are paths you'll take where you'll reach somewhere. Sometimes you feel that, sometimes you're struggling with an idea too much and you realize you're not good enough at that stage. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, to, and you need to work more on yourself before you come to that point where you can realize that idea again. So, mm. and there are two ways to do it. Either you buy more time or you buy yourself more skill. Yeah. Right? Um, you can never buy yourself more character. The character is something that you have or don't have, right? Sure. So I like, I'd like to believe that we and as a, me and then whatever has been induced and whatever has been brought on from outside into the studio comes with that character. Um, and we do a lot of design exercises which are which don't see the light of day which mm. often are good enough to show to somebody but sometimes you don't show them mm. because you know for a fact that you can't take it to its logical end to a logical manifestation without compromising on longevity or certain parameters of you know certain parameters which set out here mm. longevity sustainability sort of serviceability maintainability, a cost parameter, like we don't, we, we're not sort of bound to a cost, but we take it seriously. Sure. Right? Yeah. There, there are project budgets and timelines. So we, we are very often not in a, we, we don't work on endless timelines because if you're sort of working on a project for like 10 years or five years or seven years, and it's sort of a residence or a smaller project, then by the time, you know, the, it, you, you sort of killed at least half a generation of, of relation with that, right? While it's growing at one level, there's one way to see it that, yeah, it's still growing for seven years or eight years or 10 years, or whatever, but 20 years, however long you're making a house or a small, even a building, like even a museum. But you conceive of it then and there, and it needs to see the light of day within a few years. Um, mm. Even master plans and cities, they sort of turn around in that time. So um, you have to temper it for being for realization. Also, let's not forget that architecture is a lot more of a team expression than an individual expression. It may start, I mean, in a, in a studio like mine, it may start with a sort of uh, principal dialogue or a mentor's dialogue and all. And that's how uh, this studio works. And they, if you ask them, they'll tell you that I don't sit and draw out things for anybody. I mean, they, for, it's very rare. Hmm. And the ideas that come from, from, from me now is, are more conceptual and directional than detail-oriented or sort of very specific. Uh, so it's more like a crit that you're getting than um, anything else. And of course, the first one is a sort of is is a, is a dialogue, but beyond or a, a conceptual conversation. But like I said, I think often you have to realize that in music, I can fumble, and you, mm. do, I do that as well. I fumble in music, right? But I'm fumbling for myself, so I can stop. I can, you know, shake my hand and start again. Can't right. fumble in architecture. So they say perfection is um, is sometimes it's said that perfection is the fear of making mistakes. Would you agree to that? No, not at all. I think I think a, I think a, that might be perfection in execution, but perfection hmm. in conceptualization is not that. Right. So th- I think there are two different ways to look at it. Um, you can see it's the same with musicians, right? You can see a guy play, and and I think that sometimes 
I, I've seen a couple of very famous Indian bands play and I really admire them. I like them as people. I see them play and I say, what was that? Like, you played it like the album. Mm. So there's no emotion in it because you played it mechanically. Uh, but then, and I, my, some, of my, some of my idols do it. Like, the first time I saw Joe Satriani in London, he played and I, I was like, that, that guy's a machine. Like, how is he? A, I couldn't figure out how the sound from the fingers was, you know, the fingers to the sound and whatnot. I was like, that's insane. But then when I saw him play in Bombay, he was just, I mean, he was playing the same set, but he was just a different level. When I saw Gun and Roses, I saw them open the Discovery Center in Bhartya City. Mm. They were insane there. But when they played in Gurgaon, they were better. Really? Right? So it's, yeah. And, and mm. it's, um, it's the same, I think, in, in, in architecture, right? You will see some of the greatest practices in the world doing work, which is seminal. Yeah. And it continues because you're sort of absorbing what you've done, you're deconstructing, but you need to keep running the practice. So a classic case is, I mean, Foster, you look at his repertoire, you'll see like sure. one in crazy, principally iconic project. And then you'll see it go uh, to a point and you'll see spin-offs of it elsewhere. And then you mm. suddenly see another behemoth of a, of a project. And that's, that's, right. that's just how you conceptually developed it. Um, that's research in architecture and research in design and remember that both in music and in architecture you need to repeat things it's repetition mm. that yeah. will make you get better at something so i think and i think very often in at least in this context in india when i speak to people they are really afraid of repeating ideas and that's often because you've not spent enough time on a genuine idea mm. and once you've stumbled upon something or you've you've, you've created something which is good you need to work to iron out the, the kinks and improve it. This reminds and, me of something you had said um, to me a couple of days ago when we were chatting about uh, what Peter Cook had said to you about consistency, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. not, so what is, what is the context for that? You are not expecting consistency all the time. It's actually this time, right? Um, it's, and this is a classic example. When I speak to most people, we become hyper productive. You know, we're super yeah. productive and super. A efficient. lot of people and, are saying that. Yeah, and I'm, I really envy them. But I say, you know, to me, this is. Uh, I've never had a two-month summer holiday since high school, and you have a one-month summer holiday. You can sit in front and vegetate, and you need to well do some basic hygiene. I mean why what's the need to be super productive i mean do something that you haven't done mm. um so yes you will need to because we're all we've grown up and we're professionals and we have certain responsibilities to the outside world so you have to do certain things but do them differently um and peter cook i think i, I remember like he you know, i think we struck up a lot of conversations when he was here yeah uh, also because i'm the only kid and his you know his uh his wife yael told me that they have only one kid and who's also a musician and um, my first cousin, the musician, was a, so I, I sort of so you kind of stuck a chord. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's when he said, he said, you know, I think, uh, perf I think consistency and performance are overrated in architecture. Like, why does everything have to keep going up? And I could relate to it instantly because I felt that because the first time we really showed out, showed our work out in public, we were. It was instantly celebrated or recognized at whatever uh, level. I also could relate to it as music because you can't put yourself under this pressure to outdo yourself. Then it's just a game. Hmm. Um, and why are you doing it? Right? So if you... But some I, would just call that striving for perfection, right? I mean, at one level, you repeat and you kind of make your mistakes, you correct your mistakes, you keep improving on what you're doing. And that is, some would see that as challenging yourself and wanting to do better with every step. Um, I, I can't believe that you're striving for action every day of the year for your entire professional career. Sure. And your entire personal life. You can't. Mm. And I, anyone who says that is lying. Right. So, um, or it's just being pretentious. You can't. That And, and if you're doing so then where did you take the break to sort of turn back and say where have I come mm. and this is like a perfect opportunity for all of us to just step back and say where have we where have we arrived after all this 
So if you're not doing that, if you're not working 24 hours a day in this lockdown and in the situation that all of us are in, what is it? Like you said that you would, you know, you would recommend that people take this time out to do the things that they haven't done or do things mm-hmm. differently. What is it that you are doing in this, in this time period? What's keeping uh, you busy? A, I'm letting my studio be. I'm letting them do what they want to do. So mm. And I hope they're enjoying it. Um, B, you might be in for a lot of surprises at the end of yeah, this. Huh? <laughs> I, I, I'm getting some surprises on our, uh, uh, on, and, 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 and good ones, actually. Oh, that's mostly good. good yeah. ones, uh, mostly good ones. Hmm. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm, I think I'm writing a lot more. Okay. Something I've stopped doing. Hmm. Uh, I'm, uh, I started reading again. I remember like, at least in terms of theory and philosophy, I've never really needed to read too much because I get it all from the kind of music I was listening to. And hmm. so going right in here at like, at, at 11, all through the night or whatever. So I, I, um, I think that's something that, that. I'm doing so, but yeah, j- just taking time. But but I think even that has some level of doing something associated with it, right? And it's uh, it sort of brings me to Renzo Piano's association of the plaza versus the piazza, right? So the American mm. idea of the plaza and pia- the Italian idea right. of the piazza, right? Yeah, it's meant to do nothing. It's a space which is meant for nothing. It's almost the only Occupy. one thing I agree yeah. with De- Doshi on, which I, and I this only one thing I agree with Doshi on is that you need to have space to do nothing. Hmm. It's just nothing at all. So do just you think space. you've co- you've commented earlier about the space between buildings? Do you think that could transform into spaces where you do nothing? Or is that what is happening and nothing is being done in those spaces, unfortunately? No, I, I think it's a well understood thing, right? That the space in between buildings is where the city really happens. And the mm. city also means its people. So it's not, there are only so many occupants within. So it's always about how does the building touch the sky? How does it touch the ground? How does it interact with the ground? And what it does around it? Um, I feel that in India, we put a, so even large projects put themselves in silos. You know, you put mm. a picket fence or a boundary wall and you say, oh, this is me. But, yeah. and there's nothing else outside. So I, I, I don't think that works. I think you have to, not only program it, but also physically manifest it in a way where there is stuff happening between spaces, you know, but then you need to lose that boundary wall. That's because that's where the city occurs. That's where you'll find it parts and shaded areas where people go and hang out and, you know, or, or sort of occurrences, you know, of, uh, of the life of a city. Hmm. I'm sorry. I'm just going to interrupt you for a second because we're getting a couple of messages on Instagram for the zoom ID and password. So my colleague Siddhant, uh, who is uh, handling the Zoom account, I'm going to, Siddhant, if you can just share the Zoom ID and passwords so that people can join the Zoom meeting uh, from Instagram. Yeah. Sorry, Akshat. No, it's okay. Okay. Um, also wanted to ask you, do you, you know, you've kind of, um, you've had an interesting journey. You've traveled a lot. You've exposed yourself to various um, experiences that you've had. Um, both in terms of music, in terms of architecture, in terms of design, who or what are some of your memorable experiences through your travels? I can think of one. Mm-hmm. Well, um, you paper. went. Sorry. I have that paper, the drawing here. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That drawing was made on your instructions. Okay, <laughs> so you can pull out the elevation of the mess I made on that. <laughs> But uh, one of the stories since Akshat and I were having this chat a couple of days ago as well, uh, which I found rather fascinating was um, him having visited a very famous architect's house for a very specific purpose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> no comment I, on that. <laughs> no. um, I think when I was first traveling through Europe and uh, I'd done a, I'd bought a URAIL ticket and I'd this is when you had gone for your internship. Yes. And mm. um, I'd taken a little over a fortnight out to, to see the places I wanted to see. Right? I had a list of about 300 odd buildings. I had two cameras. Like in those days, it was slide. It was mm. transparencies, like 35 mm slide film in one and black and white film. And that's what you would do. And um, you basically just spend the entire day walking uh, to eat like, fries or a burger or whatever street food you 
were fine and you know uh chug on a coke and not really drink any water which i still don't but um i gotten into this habit of and yeah i would like i would i always thought hey, it it's what if human beings were like dogs and they could mark their territory wherever they would pee <laughs> so i would actually go and pee in <laughs> in famous buildings you know it was just mm. just to sort of do that <laughs> and i happened and well a few years ago but well quite a few years ago this was not in that trip i was invited uh for a dinner uh to uh, in basel and it just so happened to be next to pierre de miron's house and pierre had actually made they had actually made that house for it was exposed concrete with all the right marks with perfect like perfect concrete cuboid right and yeah. you know with with enough transparency at the ground level so you would see the chaise long and you saw the and you saw the marcel broyers and what it was like it was like you walked into a we trust like shawn miller showroom that lived in you know the usm furniture and uh, the usm cabinets and what it was the work right for swiss german house and uh, so i just asked i i i asked my my host who actually was living in a very traditional looking villa he was a he was a mansion but traditional mansion he was a real estate baron So I said, you know that I like that. And he, whose house is that? So he, then he told me that it's Pierre de Miron's house. He said, ah, he made it for somebody, and it was leaking. So the client left like in three years, and he now he gave the building to, uh, well, and Pierre bought it, right? Uh, okay. So I said, well, great. So I said, so he's just moving, and he said, no, he's just moving out. So what do you mean he's just moving out? You said he just bought it. So no, he bought it ten years ago. It still oh. leaks. He hasn't been able to fix the leaks. So he's bought himself another house and he's moving there. And Even he Arlon de Muron make mistakes in their houses. <laughs> Just Everybody note does. to self, guys. <laughs> it's okay if a bathroom leaks. Listen, when we were there, when uh, Namit and I were in England, there was um, the uh, you know the Westminster. Uh, no, 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 no. Meeting. But you have to come back to to that house. You haven't finished the story yet. I have. I mean, it, it's I, no. There, I did obviously go there, and then I did pee in the house, and I want to. <laughs> Use his pissoir, and I did go there, and I did use his washroom. Of course, no one was there. Ah, um, so you marked your territory in the Muron's house. Yeah, I, I can name the building. Uh, <laughs> I, I could at one time. I can't remember any any longer. Where else you marked your your territory? Yeah, well, the Villa Sauvage. Oh, nice, <laughs> nice, nicely done. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I yeah, I think I'm going to regret asking any more questions on this. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> I don't know where I was now after that. Um. But I, yeah, I think I didn't look. It. Sorry. No, I lo- I've lost my chain of thought. Okay. I know what I was talking no about. Well, we'll come back to that. Um. I also wanted to ask you how how important do you think, uh, or how how do you regard success? How important do you think that is for you? And what kind of success do you think? you've achieved so far i i think success has to be in your own terms and everyone has to i mean at least i believe everyone has to define their own terms of it um and and like any target for an individual i think that target is a moving target so for me i don't believe i'm successful at all um i can today turn around and say I have a successful collection of guitars but i can't say i'm a successful architect you know um because that's still something that's changing or evolving as it's a it's a dynamic concept just as sustainability is a dynamic concept so your success i believe is a dynamic concept uh but i can definitely look back and say i'm 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 happy about more things than i'm unhappy about mm-hmm. so uh maybe that success um uh, but i i I wouldn't put a number to it or a figure to it or a sort of definite target or like I would yeah of course if I if 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 you win an Aga Khan or a Pritzker or something it is you 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 know what it is I mean are those um, your aspirations Yeah of course I mean as an architect yeah. why not like that that is what it would be for sure um mm-hmm. and you know to to at least be in the race to say well you're in the race and you sort of lost it by a uh, you know even if you're like the the underdog in it Mm. 
with that, like I think when we got the two JKs, I was very happy uh, because I was, I think I was, I was 33. I just come out of that stroke, and uh, you know to then go to you know to get, and we had just started uh, revealing our work to mm. uh, the country and uh, and to get that like instantly out. I think I think that was a special moment uh, for me, and also because when we when it was announced, I was. I was in Germany and I was working on the India Pavilion. So I was working out of somebody else's office, and you know, and I just got this message, or I got a call and say, hey, you know, you you know, you won this, and I was like, whoa, that's big because to to me when I was studying in architect school, that was the only, you know, it was the oldest, biggest award. Uh, mm. So it 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 had a nostalgic value, and uh, like I know that Ashok Lal had got one, and uh, I think Viren got one as well. Uh, for something, and you know, so all the guys we respected had had one. So you had to have one, and I had two. So that was cool. So you get a place on the big on the big people's table. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, Manit got one, I think I remember as well. I, Manit got one or two. In the, so yeah, that, that I think that was yeah, like that was like a call you've grown up. Hmm. You're not a Barsati practice anymore. Well, clearly not. We can see sprawling lawns behind you. So Barsati definitely yeah, is because we could we could make a building there. <laughs> We we wanted to only make, reason. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody wants to nobody wants to build there anymore. That's why. Yeah. Any more? So I, <laughs> no, I, I I think yeah. I I feel happy when I come here. I'm in a. I'm I'm. Uh, it's a pleasant. Pl- I mean, it's an enviable place to work out of. In if you're in a city like Delhi, this mm. is a. It's a it's a, it's a very nice place. Uh, I'll I'll in, I can invite. I mean, I, it's an open invitation for anyone whoever. Or should come just like drop a mail or a call or something and come over for a coffee. We have very good coffee and we have uh, we have nice green trees. Careful what you offer. We've got I think more than two hundred people who are watching this talk right now. It's really shit. <laughs> yeah. So guys, if you want and to visit then, Akshat's office, please contact him directly. <laughs> okay. Then it's a rave. We we can have, we can do a rave. <laughs> well, you should be uh, stretching for an hour and a half before that so that you can perform then for everyone. Yeah. That I think I, I think I'm sort of getting ready to that. I'm getting to that point. Do you feel like you want to perform again, again in front of an? I'm sorry. I'm actually going to stop here for a second because we've lost our Instagram feed, and I want to start it again. So, guys on Zoom, if you can just give me a second. Actually, I'm going to invite you back on uh, okay. Insta. Yeah. I don't know how to do that. So do I just click? No. Did you? You're not. Can you see that we've gone live? Yes, and I've got. So it. just yep. open that story, and yeah. I'm going to invite you. Uh, architecture discipline, right? Yeah. Uh, guys on Instagram, we just lost the feed because I think we've crossed an hour's mark, and but we are back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are you getting the feed on Instagram? Yes. Yes, I am. Oh, okay. Uh, Perfect. So should we? Ah, okay. I don't have to do anything, right? You don't have to do anything. At yeah. all. Okay. Um, should we take a couple of questions and then we can kind of continue the conversation because I think we're getting a lot of comments and things. Um, if anybody has any questions, they can just send it. Uh, on Zoom, you can just send a message to uh, <clears throat> to. To us and I'll pick up some of the questions from there. Unfortunately, on Instagram, I because the video quit. So if you've asked any questions on Insta, I can't I'm access them wait. anymore. So please, uh, <laughs> so on Instagram, if anyone has questions, please. There's a little uh, square at the bottom of your screen with a question mark on it. If you click it and just send in your questions, I can pick them up from there. Or if you'd like to join the Zoom call, you can do that as well. Um, and people on Zoom, just type in your questions into the and send it as a message, and we'll pick them up from there. Yeah. Um, Mini, Minari, yes. I have a question for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> there, I can't miss it. So this, the Virin question to Akshay. So, Virin, can you speak up a little bit so that our friends on Instagram can hear you? Is this loud enough? Uh, I'll repeat it anyway. So why don't you proceed? Oh, okay. So uh, my question is to um, Akshat. He got highly stimulated uh, from his childhood till date by the by the music of the West. Say I call it the West. It could be, of course, if you break it up, it could be. I mean, I am putting it under one umbrella. Say the West. Um, certainly, it has to do with his age. 
that he was young and young people can can be drawn towards things that are more exciting more more challenging and uh, can find also uh, the way like he rightly said a catharsis no um, finding your own voice is easier to uh, when you relate to the western music do you feel akshat that uh, your affinity towards the the european architecture or the paradigm that is very strong um, uh, which you said is partly also stimulated by hiko pimelblau and all the four high tech architects do you think this affinity has to do with your affinity towards music and that you slide uh, almost naturally organically into your architecture and you don't say while and that's very interesting to note and share maybe with the audience while all your gurus or the teachers at tvb school were trying to orient themselves towards architecture or architectural interpretation of indian modernism and how how do you take it further how do you interpret in today's context indian architecture and find find your own voice you rather chose to go the other way any 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 narrative or any uh, any anecdote that led to it um yeah man only this is it okay why don't you <laughs> maybe akshat can through the answer only yeah. uh, i think um, so a yes uh, i think um, what was the indian music available to us at the time it was you know there used to be a program called chitra chitra har chitra har yeah that used to come right after krishi darshan wednesdays so, and fridays <laughs> so yes yeah so that's the sort of music the the sort of indian cinema music some of which was nice some of which still is nice um what the production value was um and and then there was um <clears throat> then there was classical music most of which was sort of these gharanas and it was kind of mummified in a way um that was it was it was there weren't too many too many people who you could see relate to aspire to be or to be like or to you know sort of learn from so i think when i was when, at that age there was still ravi shankar uh zakir hussain ala rakha uh, and i would listen to that music i still do you know uh, but it's not most of that was instrumental and not vocal music right so it uh, and you can't it's very hard to listen to 3 hours of western of of instrumental music over and over again unless something's captivating you um the 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 move towards and i and i know that like the move or the affinity for or that i was drawn to was a certain kind of architecture which was more put together like a meccano was definitely because of my understanding of music it was because i was always pushing the boundaries on the fretboard and on my amps and what not which most gravity based architecture did not have at the time like most of most material use most architecture using as a certain kind of material palette and what not neither were we talking about in traditional architectures extremely large spans public spaces of a certain nature i mean i had like the the zongs in bhutan or we done case studies and i spent a lot of time in the mountains and in organic settlements cuz that you would do it at tvb so you would appreciate certain formal resolution certain ways of planning space and how you would experience space and how pe- how people could live but most of it was for simpler programs and simpler needs it wasn't for complex program complex needs actually that was a debate in my head there was a it was a ravaging debate which is why my undergraduate thesis was about that subject so i had studied uh, gandhi's philosophy uh, ef schumacher's philosophy um the the uh, theory of evolution by darwin and then i studied buckminster fuller and a couple of other uh, guys and i think what i found was that at that time people like renzo piano peter salt uh, marky were doing things that were 
and also of course were doing things that were extremely progressive in their expression in their technique uh, and they were not yet the more architecture was contemporary and high modern you know uh, it fit in i realized that your tools and technology will change like let's not forget brick is a kind of technology as well but what doesn't change is the need for inspiring techniques it's not like indian materials and indian techniques don't inspire us i mean actually i think i take pride in the fact that we use very simple materials in our work but our work is not and it is and a lot of our work is simplistic but the technique with which we do it is i think it's fairly sophisticated and that's a learning that comes from the west because i don't i haven't found or i hadn't found that refinement in in uh, in in vernacular or traditional indian architecture the demand levels or the performance levels were not that high that isn't to say that there is no emotion in the work there's a lot of emotion in indian architecture in in in, in traditional buildings as well it's the same with music and it's also the same in western and music as well so there are you you can hear a band like coldplay which is really zero technique or or you too for that matter it's like very simplistic like if you really look at the tabulature for you too music is nothing it's only mostly effects it, but there is there is this little really glitz of this ephemeral quality that sort of in, in, engages you and entices you is the same with when you hear say hari prasad chaurasia play you know it has that feel when they be sort of going up into these these crazy tangents um but i think for the kind of building programs that excited me there was no other um there was no other parallel now we can and and i think that the tie, the conversation in that we were having was always in english language also the techniques of learning were very western so we weren't learning indian techniques of composition and what not we i do i believe try and layer very strongly layer uh our materials our identity our our own narrative into in our work in our architectural work and a lot of our our, our interior work as well but uh, i don't think there was there were very few people who could sort of take that to another level with us in 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 college i mean ashish ganju was one such uh, ashok lal was another such Akshat, I, you need to speak up. People on Instagram can't hear you anymore. All right. Can you guys hear me now? <laughs> Zoom is audible. Insta is in. What does that mean? Zoom. I think Zoom is audible. Uh, Insta is in. So you okay. need to probably just get closer to your device. Right. Okay. So um, yeah. I I think I, I think and I think that's a debate that lives on at least in my head, and I think it will continue to live on till I'm done with whatever I'm doing. It is. your identity versus uh what you have to do and i think i think that's a that's a that's an identity that everyone has to struggle uh i'm getting that again uh, i think your uh, is your connection to instagram okay cuz like it's getting be. hung okay wait let's see oh phone needs to cool down before you can use it sorry <laughs> guys hang okay, on okay uh, a short break for instagram just uh... hang on i'll <laughs> Akshat's phone has gotten too hot. <laughs> I go on my iPad. Okay, we're just switching devices. Um. <laughs> so how? I don't know how to do this now. I'm. You have to just invite me again. Just sign in. I'm done. You're signed in. Okay, I'm going to invite you again. Hello. One second. I don't see you here. You are you watching? Are you watching the live video? Yeah, I got the invite from you. Okay. No. Sorry, guys. Just a second. Okay, there you are. I added you on Insta Live again. Mm-hmm. Uh I hope that's better. Can someone just respond on Instagram to tell us whether you can hear us? Akshat if you just say a couple of things so that they can Hi guys, hello back again. Yeah. Hopefully the iPad okay. will not heat up too much. <laughs> okay, Ferry, thank you. 
Akshat not there yet. I am right here, Ashmit. Don't lie. Interestingly, Ashmit's on both Insta and Zoom. <laughs> Why he wants to be? He wants to be everywhere all the time. I'm losing. Okay, you're back. Um, yeah, you're, you're, uh, you have mentioned in the past that you kind of, even when you're designing, even with your architecture, you design in monochrome. And that's how you think. And is that a reflection of how you project yourself as well? No, may I interrupt there, Mirnali? Yes, very. <clears throat> it was, in fact, the other way. I may uh, rephrase this question. So I was the going question to could be, the question bit. could yeah, Mirnali, the question could be, while Akshat is wearing mostly black, as we know him, I mean, I've never, hardly earlier he had orange trousers. Um, I still have those trousers. Of, you still have those, ones, yes. <laughs> but nearly everything, everything was black. While, and that's my question to him, while his architecture and especially the interiors are a, have an have a incredible, incredible selection of colors. I've seen his Neel Sutra, which was done in the lower ground uh, next to the pool um, in the Obrois in, in Gurgaon. It's a fabulous interior. It's one of the most beautiful interiors I have experienced in India in the contemporary realm. And I feel he's very skillfully using colors. And my question therefore would be uh, linked and unlike Mirnali, what you observed would be linked. Where does this come from? This, this, skill of using such beautiful colors and uh, curating them or orchestrating them in a very harmonious way. I've seen many AD publications, many of the interiors actually come together because of the expensive material that have been used, have been showcased, less of the way the colors or shapes have been orchestrated. In this case, I see always that he's able to compose them and bring them nicely together. Where does this come? Because I also don't know. It's only recently that I've seen and following his uh, recent interior works, which is which are very colorful. So just to add to that, I hope everyone on Instagram heard that basically uh, what Virendi is saying is that although Akshat projects himself to be uh, very monochromatic, when his work, and especially his interior works, have a lot of color in it. Um, the reason I said it the other way around is because Akshat and I were having this conversation a couple of days ago. And um, a statement that was made at that point was how when they're designing, they're thinking monochromatic, uh, a mo they're thinking of a monochromatic panel. They design in black and white is what Akshat had said. And then color comes as a much later component of the process. It's, it's interesting how I see it that, um, and this, so my opinion could be clouded by the conversation that Akshat and I had, but a lot of your work is still very monochromatic, but the colors are used as accents and they form like these pops of moments within the work. Mm -hmm. So if you know, if you'd like to comment oh. on that, because a lot of, especially your recent work, the Jodhpur project was uh, completely... Um, yeah, one color. Sorry? Yeah. It's also one color. It's, it's, one it's color. a teal. No, it's a teal. It's a teal. Yeah, but over here, with, especially with Jodhpur, it's still uh, one color, but there is that very vibrant color that has mm -hmm. been used. Um, so there is that distinction between what you project for yourself versus the work that you're doing. So okay, so just to get this the black out of the way, I'm not projecting anything. Um, I used to. Be, I think I offended a couple of serious senior IS officers with offensive t-shirts early on in my days. Like, and my people who knew me got complaints that, you know, so-and-so can't, um, uh, doesn't know how to sort of, um, how to dress for a, for a formal occasion uh, or for a, for a senior serious meeting. Uh, but it was 
and remember like when you get out of architecture school you you tend to think you know you tend to be a certain way and um a little you're not so well there's, there's, you're not you don't consider what you dress as carefully um i would always dress properly but you know i didn't think that someone would take offense to a t-shirt uh, to a colorful t-shirt per se um so i started wearing black because you could just wear a black t-shirt and jeans go to site be in your studio do a meeting throw on a jacket and go for a proper meeting you know with the client or with you know with with uh, with somebody so you could basically just wear that same attire from morning to night and it wouldn't really get dirty right uh, all you had to do was deal with the heat which i i can take the heat so it didn't matter so it was uh, convenient soon, it was convenient and i think i think soon after i realized that when i wear any other color i can sense i can see myself in my peripherals right so when if you're wearing a white shirt or a colorful shirt you can see it here at the moment i i my physicality kind of disappears i realized much later after people started making uh making an op- making observation on me that i probably st- i pop out because i'm wearing black but by then it had just become a habit already and i i i you know i was too invested in the habit financially and intellectually to change it you know to um the pop of color in the work is actually very similar to the pop of uh i i i want to be happy i want to make happy spaces i don't want to make somber and dark spaces um and even when we use black or when i use black it there's uh, even at home we, there's a lot of black at home like my entire floor at home is black but we have a timber floor and we have a white ceiling and there's a lot of art on the on the wall and the furniture is colorful so those things pop out so you, but what happens with black on vertical surfaces that shadows disappear right whereas on a white mm-hmm. wall with a vertical and i've always sort of given people that that analogy that you know white with no light on it as gray is is really really sort of non is 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 really sort of not a very defined refined experience it's not a positive experience so i think um, so what the black allows us to do is it allows us to sort of almost focus a person's view on what they want to on, on what you want them to see um the color the use of color i think uh, I, i think i mean I, i'm post rationalizing this and i know what viren is saying because um and remember viren i think you should remember that we discovered the power of black in an interior when we were doing the triveni office in noida in 2003 or 2004 uh, how black transforms glass right so you paint a wall black and then suddenly it becomes a mirror and it's not and it's not really a mirror but it's a lot more reflective um but the color was pointed out to me a few years ago by by a filmmaker uh, who i really respect and he said you know actually the use of color and i didn't even realize it um i didn't realize that i was using color in that way um i i think if i have to post rationalize i think it comes from the need to create you know like when i saw the baraya airport by Richard Rogers, or even the Sons of Pompidou, you know, there are these these buildings could just as well have been monochromatic, but there was you know, the pop of color mm-hmm. does something. If you take that color away, and I it I can equate it to say the music of Van Halen, which is my biggest influence, right? Eddie Van Halen is. So there's always this chugging door rhythm, and then suddenly there's this flash of like stupendous skill. And even when you're doing that, there is a there is a loose rhythm which is low, and then there are these intermittent highs that sort of you know just sort of pop out. um and uh, you know and and uh and that comes naturally i don't know why it does i don't know where it comes from but there have been times when we've tried to to sort of move away from it like there's a project we did for trump which kind of completely moved away because we, i just wanted to a com- very refined silent space we've also done uh an office recently from mr overoy where it's the same thing where it's a very silent palette but yeah there is there are still accents so i think it's more i mean yes the color it and color does bring joy it does you know sort of get you and actually and so much so that recently someone pointed out that most of our website almost our buildings are red somewhere i think red just came from the park tel aviv right it's like a long 
the longest wavelength you'll see it no matter where you see it you know you it'll it'll pop out at you and it started with the discovery center because it was a building in the middle of nowhere so how do you get people to see it you know if you don't go high and we couldn't go high so the big red egg was would have been visible through the green it would have been contrasting with the green um so the pop color is to me is almost a monochrome i mean it is almost like a pure monochromatic statement in itself you know the the solid colors and somehow we managed to get on with purples and then more primary colors and it seems to have become inherent in the way we compose things after a point so i it's definitely not there when we're planning something it's not it's not an exit route you know so very often you will use an accent wall <clears throat> we've never done an accent wall hmm. uh it's always a way to it's not a it's not a way to to distract your eye but it's a way to attract your eye more towards something uh the discovery center the program that we had been given also internal program it came through a lot of experience through some very heavy weight real estate uh, consultants abroad uh, we finally it came to a point where you know where the audit the function of the auditorium was necessitated in the middle of the building but we wanted it up in front so sort of putting it in red also wasn't just an external uh, sort of attraction it also sort of gave it importance on the inside of the building um but like i th- i think there is there is a fundamental need for in me to create spaces that are happy and not somber whereas the architecture has to be solid and often somber uh, in because and i and that and that struggle for heavy versus light the contrast in composition the contrast in thought the contrast in in sort of balancing that dialectic exists in my life and it exists in our work and i think and, and the color is a reflection of that and what about I yourself also, i also personally i also really like personally i i really like uh, i like i like anthrax and megadeth but i also enjoy listening to spice girls <laughs> in my mind i wish i could compose a spice uh, uh, you know a spice girl song really so, uh, so when we have yeah, that day that uh, at your studio we know what to expect now it, it it'll be spice girls on acid <laughs> <laughs> so but interestingly um you know there's there's obviously a sense of discipline in what you what you do in how you work in the way you behave um there's a very distinct sort of um like you stand up straight right? right but yeah i mean not literally but okay. um okay. any mistakes that you've made that you think have been significant in your journey yeah i think we all make mistakes i mean you make mistakes in your personal life you make mistakes in your professional life you make mistakes with your own self um not continuing to practice 20 hours a day was a mistake having two cups of coffee on first thing in the morning on an empty stomach with a with a throbbing uh, artery was a mistake um not looking where i'm driving was a mistake um you know uh, uh, yeah enough and more buying 70 guitars was a mistake you know um, you think of course <laughs> just said there's, there's actually that the, there's so many things that ashok says that i can relate to right architecture discipline was a practice that i was trying very hard not to start i think it's from the practice uh, just to like, don't i don't want that responsibility on myself right it is it is a tremendous responsibility when you have uh, when you have people who look up to you and whose life whose happiness and livelihood you are responsible for also. so why did you do it then I don't know. I mean, I mean, that, it's a long story. Um, I think I was, com- I felt compelled to do it, which is at that time, which is why I did it. And I'm not saying I regret it, but I'm saying that there are, you know, you always see these things. Like I would have probably regretted not having started it as well. You know, I'm happy. Um, so but are- you've always been the person who wants to do your own thing, right? Like you, you started Dewang the minute you got out of college. So you I were Dewang. Hey, it was Manav and I who started the mom. Yeah. So when you guys when you guys started it, but then you were very conscious of the idea that you wanted to have your own 
set up and you wanted to do things the way you wanted to do them? Uh, no, I really not. I mean, in my mind, no, I, I, I really just want to be instructed by someone to do something <laughs> and I'm happy doing that. Like just someone says, draw this, make this drawing and I'll make it. I'm just very happy. But yes, there is a critical, there is a, there is this critical thinker in me, unfortunately, that would then never do it just the way it's meant to be done. Mm. And uh, so I, I am, I like to innovate. I like to improvise. And that maybe, I don't know where it comes from. I, I like to innovate. I've always been a tinkerer. So no matter what I do, I will tinker, even if it's a drawing or whatever. Uh, it's it's a tinker. Minali, you're getting some messages saying you can't be heard, by the way. I can't be heard? Yeah. Someone I think that's an oh. earlier message. Okay. All right. Okay. Right. So we're both audible um, now? Yes, you are. Okay. For me, you're on both. Okay. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> I know I've always been a tinkerer. I've always just sort of taken things apart. So if you give me a toy, if I would be given a toy, I would not ever use the toy for what it was beyond a couple of hours or a couple of days. And right after it would be pulled apart and made, and made something else off. Right. I mean, I've blown up telephones by plugging them into power sockets. I have, um, I've electrocuted myself a few times. I've sort of put LEDs like LEDs from like flash guns into, I mean, those pistols, right? Kids pistols into power sockets and just with the one and had like minor explosions. Um, uh, put a, I remember one time I put, a, uh, you know, in a planter, I put a, put this firecracker that actually brought down, like my mom came out shouting because she said, you know, I heard this, I heard glass shattering after, uh, after Diwali, uh, one day after Diwali. And I thought I'd broken the neighbor's windows and suddenly I hear my mom shat, coming up screaming, saying, what just happened? And I'd actually shattered all the windows in the house. So, <laughs> so it's, I, I don't think it's the need for perfection It's maybe the need to destroy that sort of <laughs> shit that way or this sort of bumbling, fumbling idiot that sort of uh, makes you do things a certain way. Uh, no, to be honest, um, I don't think there was an equal opportunities firm in, in India at the time when we were doing this. And I think, I think, uh, Matra had taken its toll on me, not in a bad way, but because when we started, we were in one small apartment in Sheikh Sarai. Oh, when I started with Matra, we were in one small apartment in Sheikh Sarai and we had gone through hell with a couple of projects where, where I think both of us in our own individual capacities were uh, heavily invested. You know, there was a project, there was a resort project and then there was another project that was my first project that I was doing. I didn't know how and sort of Virena had left me alone at the time to do it. And I was young, I was just three months out of graduated from college or maybe five months graduated from college and I was doing it. And, uh, I, and I still look at those drawings and I, I, I've lost the drawing set by the way, but I, the, the, because they were on tracings and you would, you know, those were days would print on tracing and then take blueprints of those, those days. But I think there, and then from going from there into, you know, what the current studio is, at least half of what the current studio is and, uh, going through a certain iteration of works and you know uh, it, it wasn't easy doing architecture at the time it wasn't uh, it wasn't easy for him I know that it wasn't easy for me either and uh, I think I think there were you know and you do need to sort of sometimes reinvent the studio I mean that's what we're doing at architecture in these days uh, so it it sort of became this need I mean I, I felt I was feeling a void at the time Hmm. when I started. And where do you think it's headed now? No idea. None? More, more, more vacation, I hope. Another month of vacation. <laughs> I want my two so and a half months you, of holiday. You are a full, full summer worth of vacation. Yeah. I would like, I, I think, I hope it's headed to a place where I turn 17 again, you know, maybe 22 again. Yeah, that, that's where I would want it to be. How I would you do no things idea. differently? If you, if you could start again, how would you do it differently? I would exercise more. I would, uh, I would make it a habit to play the guitar one and a half hours a day, no matter what. Mm. Uh, I would, uh, I would not drink coffee. 
and I would uh, read more. And I definitely I definitely always have one research uh, section in the studio. We have that now, but mm. I would definitely always have one small group of people dedicated for research in the studio that was never to be distracted by anything else, come what may. Okay. Um, besides music, and which has obviously been a great influence on you, your work, the way you put things together, just the way you are, uh, but besides music, is there something else that you feel has been a strong influence or has informed your journey? I think everything. I mean, travel changes you. Travel experience, exposure changes you. Your friends change you. I have some, I, 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 I'm very proud of the friends I have. Um, some are, um, some, a lot of them are much older than I am. Uh, my, and, um, the people I've met, like pe people in interactions with people, some clients um, change you, uh, they influence you in many ways. Uh, so I think, but yeah, big influences would probably be music, architecture, architecture for sure. I mean, there's no way. I mean, that's what I've been living and breathing for the last, uh, what, since 20, what, 23 years now, 23 years. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot. Like that's, more than 50% of my life is been, and, and that's your conscious life, right? So seriously reading up and, and sort of practicing architecture. Um, the people around me, like the young, uh, the, you know, it's insane when I come into the studio and sometimes it's someone's birthday and I say, hey, when were you born? And they say 97. And I'm like, wow. You know how, or whatever. <laughs> you just suddenly feel old. Uh, I think the realization that I'm now 40, uh, it affects me and influences me in many ways now influences many decisions um so yeah are you a quick friends, decision maker a super quick decision i'm, I'm i mean i can get stuck but uh, i joke about this with arvind you know from Kriya. i said you're just you're paralyzed but and he, he <laughs> actually he pointed that out. he i don't realize a lot of things about myself he pointed he said you're a very quick decision maker and i realized that i am like i will take a punt I will take a punt and I will stand by it, whether it be a design, be it work. I will, I, if I commit, I will commit or I'll make sure we are committed and we will just, we will make sure it's done. Is no, that, is that the me. performer in you who, who kind of enables that where you just get on stage and you start playing and you, you might have mistakes, you might falter, but you have to kind of plow through. You can't stop and think and analyze and, you know, go back and start from scratch. You just, you just have to carry on. Oh well, yeah, of course. I, look, you have to do things to do things. And when you do things, you will make mistakes. It's about how you plow through those mistakes, how you stand by them, what mm. you make of them, right? So if you take it, if you, again, because I'm tired of taking musical analogies, but if you do the biggest things, the greatest solos, the greatest moments in music are mistakes, right? They are, and the greatest moments and greatest things are born out of limitations, right? Like, Marmstein was playing 50 watt Marshall combos and that's when he invented his sound. And, you know, uh, uh, you know, it was, you know, rock and roll was invented because someone was playing, couldn't record without, you know, was recording and the speaker cone was torn. So, you know, mm. the kinks, that's how re you really got me came about. That's how it happens in, in our design work as well, right? You'll stumble upon patterns, techniques and things while you're trying to do something. But you have to be trying to do them intensely enough. If you're not doing them, if you're playing to a formula, if you're basically going to be cutting and pasting something that somebody else has done or that you've done before every time over, or even if you're cutting and pasting what you've done before, if you're not trying to improvise, if you're not trying to get something out of it or get somewhere with it, and you're not involved enough with it, you'll never realize. Hmm. Um, we have a, a question related to this uh... Maybe we can have Brithima pose the question herself. If Brithima is on Zoom with us. Hi, Brithima, you can you unmute yourself and ask your question if you're still there. Hi, Manali, how are you? Good. Hi, Brit. Hi. Okay, so I think uh, I lost, I got disconnected. My question earlier was, uh, can you share um, some notes, specific notes about how uh, music has translated into your work. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. So it could, I mean, in terms of color or material or, or composition sure. or anything. I'm happy to, and if you're not happy with my answer, I will reveal your pet name, <laughs> which is even more embarrassing than Minal and Meech. No, Akshay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that by now. Thanks a lot, Akshay. <laughs> <laughs> Revenge is in the mail, Akshay. <laughs> Um, just for the benefit of the Instagram audience, I'm just going to repeat the last question in case you didn't catch that. She's asking, um, she's asking Aksha to share a few specific examples of how his relationship with music translates or has translated into his work. So, um, you know, this is something that I'm asked often. And I think everyone expects some huge, terrible answer. I, I don't think I, um, so while at one level there is this huge debate that's going on students come to me for it as well you know how does is architecture frozen music and base? and of course there can be analogies to everything any structure can be analogous to any other structure so architecture can be a frozen language architecture can be a frozen painting you know it could you know it could be something more cerebral it could be dialectic thought and uh, and whatnot but i think um, and and there was definitely a time where i would translate my understanding of modes and scales into proportioning systems but these are all tools and techniques that you're using to while you're trying to sort of build a an understanding of certain things on for yourself but when it goes beyond that, when it becomes a lot more inherent and cerebral, it's, it's kind of like a stroke. Like it's like, it's like a stroke. Uh, uh, it's like a, it's like you're painting or you're drawing with a charcoal, charcoal pencil or a, or a, or a fat sketch pencil. It doesn't, it, it's more inherent. And I think in this conversation, I mentioned a few, like, you know, the chugging of, you know, the low end chugging of, you know, Van Halen's music. So there's always a low end and there's in, intermittent highs. Um, you know, you're always, pay, you're, your mind sort of conditioning it. So I'm sort of pacing myself in that manner. And I think when I'm done with a project or when I'm done with the first sketch of a project, it, you can, I can draw an analogy, but that analogy is no longer about scale and proportions or sort of movement and rhythm and so on and so forth. It's more about the inherent understanding of uh, the what what music has made me as a person and how the need to express myself will eventually come out onto the drawing board when I'm sitting on the drawing board. But a lot of what we do in architecture discipline is cerebral. A lot happens through verbal instructions and not through drawn instructions. Actually, I find it very hard and, or non-drawn communication, right? So I'm not just going to say verbal. It's like it's you communicate in many other ways. And like they say, 90% of communication is non-verbal, right? So we have that in the studio. Um, uh, and, and so it's the value system. And the value system is formed from the ideological understanding I've had of musical things, you know, of what I've understood from lyrics and words and uh, uh, philosophical albums or the way someone has put something together or way how or or, the, or or what some musicians are trying to say more than you know eventually proportioning systems and, and expression techniques i hope that answers your question if it doesn't you know what's coming <laughs> okay we've got a couple of questions on instagram um one of which says just a second um, I would love to get Akshat's views on the concept of habitat, the affinity we develop for spaces. Is it something we are conditioning ourselves or it's something more primal and embedded in our, and sorry, the question kind of trails off. It's a very complicated question. Yes. Virena told me not to go into hyperbole, so I'm not going to hyperbole. <laughs> okay, so there's another one. What's your favorite book? Uh, can you discuss with your ideas and thoughts, then you will make it a new way through it. I'm not sure what this means, but do you want to answer what your favorite book is? 1984 by George Orwell. Okay. And, and look at where we're standing today. 
Oh, wow. <laughs> Uh, we also have Ankit Tomar, who is with us on Zoom. Can you please? I'd ask you to just a little bit so our Instagram audience can catch that. Yeah. Hi, Akshat. Ankit, this side. So, Hi, my, uh, yeah. So my question was, uh, what have been your inspiration when it comes to composing music, or even if you write songs? I mean, is it more influenced by? the socio-political views that you possess or is it like just like you said that you write you want you hear Spice Girls and you're like I want to do it so like how does it hit you with the compositions and all the songwriting I think um, you know when you're younger and you're sort of maybe more nascent in any one discipline or both disciplines you tend to um, you tend to have more literal sort of translations, you know. So I've done this and I've done that, or I do this and it comes like so. Uh, to me, playing the guitar is uh, is a cathartic experience, right? So it's I am again I'm not I I steer away from the word music because I don't think I play music. I play the guitar, mm. right? And that sound moves me it moves my physicality, right? So I have to, for example, stand up and play. I have to put a strap around myself that I have to have a giant amplifier in front of me. It cannot be through headphones. I hate it. Uh, it can't be through a tiny little amplifier. It has to be a four by 12 or at least a two by 12 speaker that's sort of playing at at least 70 decibels, if not more. I mean, usually it's crossing a hundred something decibels when I'm playing. So it's, um, it's not that you will be playing something and you'll suddenly say, ah, I can compose with this. No, that's just what I'm doing to relax myself. To mm -hmm. just sort of disconnect from everything. Else. And then what comes out is, 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 a, is, is a whole different thing. Uh, just the socio-political angle of it is a value system, right? What do I believe should be, is the right thing for, for, for us to, to do what do i believe is the right so, so when viren asked me about uh indian architecture or something else you know there's we're doing what we're doing because i believe that you need to reduce your material consumption i believe in progress right i believe that if the, if we if we have reached if we can fly in an airplane and go from you know 50 degrees on a tarmac to minus some insane number of uh, uh minus some insane temperature then why is it that we need to, and, and that's happening only through that, you know, through a few hundred millimeters, why, or through, well, about 150 millimeters, why are we going, why do we need to build 600 millimeters worth of things? Because that's then, you're taking more space and you're making, you're using a lot more material. I know that there's, an, uh, there's a whole different conversation that that spins off in terms of what is high embodied energy and embodied energy and what it takes to sort of, that's a different conversation, but the expression is an expression of progress, right? So we, would you still speak the same language that you were speaking in the 1800s? You wouldn't. Would you still mm -hmm. write the same way? Do we still write letters to each other on pieces of paper? We don't. Was there something wrong with it? No, there was nothing wrong with it. But we're now just sending out emails and now we're sending out messages. And if we were to have had this conversation uh, even a few years ago, we would have been sitting across the table from each other. But today we're, we're on, uh, we're in front of, we're in front of uh, you know, screens. All of this informs, you know, all these experiences inform what you do and how you become. Uh, um, to me, playing the guitar is a window to another world or a window out of this world. You know, it's not, I'm not doing it for any, any sort of spin-off benefits. It was never done as that. And that's why it's not even an, it's, there is zero level of commercial interest on it. I mean, by commercial, I also mean investment in myself, right? There's zero level of that for me. If you today say, sell me a guitar, you will not get it. If you say, what happens to your guitar after you? Nobody gets them, right? But if I like you and if I love you and if, if, if you're worthy, if I feel you're worthy, you don't have to be worthy and I'm not always right, you get one from me, you know? And people have just got them from me because I felt they deserve it you know, more than me. And so there are, you know, there, so there are, there's a relationship you form uh, form with these things and that that could be 
you could form a relationship with some objects and you could not form a relationship with some objects there are some guitars that have songs in them some don't have songs in them some are just sort of just masterpieces of craftsmanship but they need to be kept in a case uh, i think the same applies for architecture like there is some emotion in architecture and so there is this, always this rollicking debate about you know whether it has to be whether it's an art form or a science i think it's both but even in the highest levels of physics there is a hypothesis and there is a uh, a sort of poetic understanding of what the universe is you know and uh, let's not forget that most modern science is based on the assumption of a miracle which is the big bang right so it is someone's great sort of post rationalized philosophy that we're still sort of following um, even charles darwin said that if so many things have happened then it is possible then then it is probable that we have evolved this way it is the most cohesive theory we have it is not a it is not a proven fact yeah uh, coming back to your guitars you said that uh, this is for the benefit of everybody over here if you want a guitar it better be nice to akshat <laughs> i'm only gunning for the stationery okay i can't play the guitar but um, have you ever sold one any of yours i have i sold i sold a few yeah a i few? sold i i i sold two how it wasn't it heartbreaking two. look at that time you have like limited pocket money or limited earnings and and then you take a you have a trade off so i had this yamaha that wasn't working which was the the plate guitar that i was carrying i would carry around with myself all the time and i sold it for 24000 rupees at that time to in in maybe 97 98 to to uh, to buy a marshall amplifier right because you know there is you know guitar players are conservative and by the way guitar players something called gas right called gear acquisition syndrome right you want more and more gear so i wanted an amplifier i sold this guitar to buy the amp and few years later i regretted it because it was an absolutely unique thing right you never know when you'll get it back or not and so i chased i chased people for 20 years i think i finally found it in 2017 the same on piece on youtube the same piece the same piece right and i the same piece it had made its way to germany and i wrote to the guy i told him you know i had a short conversation with him he first ignored me thought i was mad and i wrote to him on facebook and then he um he discovered well he figured that i'm not i'm not kidding so he charged me a bomb for it i think he was testing me and he he didn't think i would say yes and i said yes so he couldn't back out and he asked me to send him a case and it was shipped to my friend's house in in switzerland which is which my my poor friend is uh, is um has to suffer all my you know most of my guitar <laughs> shipments from across the world yeah, indulgences uh, but, <laughs> indulgences <laughs> and um when i got there and uh, you know I, there was a note in the in the case from the guy you know, he said look i i i really cleaned you out on the on the on the on the on the guitar but i but seeing what you know what you what you told me and and seeing your you know what your facebook profile and reading a little bit about you i figure you're into certain things and you might like this so he actually had mm. put in cd's that were unreleased records or unreleased copies of uh, you know some dream theater recording some james lebrie who the vocalist of and dream theater is one of my favorite bands so there were like unreleased cd copies of that stuff you know which was like all ready and like sort of demo, demos and what not he said i used to record with with i used to record james lebrie he actually also said that this particular guitar has been on these 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 songs so you know you might want to hear them so these are all so, original oh, recordings yeah yeah is it on and you have them with you now i have them with me yeah So this is a little similar can... to the to the sketch that you acquired corbusier sketch yeah <laughs> that was also something right you end up looking for lights i end up in a small village in switzerland which is well actually where my friend lives and i saw his dining table light i said i want it and it was a it's an elegant super high end you so when i went looking for it and uh, i mean i went to the shop and the guy for a moment was for a while was just like absolutely <clears throat> dismissive of me um because i couldn't speak a word of swiss german and he was irritated he had a sling around his arm he broke his, his right hand and finally he you know i had a I had a friend with me she was translating and uh, you know i kept asking him a question about certain fixtures which were obviously iconic pieces and he 
there was a no more to answer then he finally said you know where is this guy from and she said he's from india the moment he heard that he said have you heard of chandigarh i said yes he said do you know who lekha bhaji is i said i mean she said so i my answer was i'm an architect of course hmm. and he said do you know, come here and he took me to this one corner in his shop <clears throat> which was you know like a little corner with you know some kabuzia memorabilia and it turns out and of course the building was quaint i could never get it it, it felt very 70s like 60s german silo painted a certain tint of green and what not but turns out that he he said his, his grandfather was working in kabuzia the atelier and he had start his grand, the, the sketch the initial drafts for chandigarh started from that very building from that very space and that was some memorabilia and he gave me some and of course the building was drafted by his grandfather well and he was helped by kabuzia to do so don't forget the swiss swiss currency actually has kabuzia on it so the most famous architect in the world yeah so it's interesting I, all so your ex- sorry go ahead no no please I was saying all your experiences. Uh, nothing is in. You don't do anything in half measures. Right? Everything is just like intense, and then kind of like just break it or make it. It chases you, right? So you, I, I think you manifest things. You know, you manifest what you want, and if you want it badly enough, and you chase it, uh, even if you chase it in your head, right? Like there are, and and I, I kid you not, like I have. there are design resolutions that come to you in the shower similarly you can actually go and play phrases on your guitar if you haven't or on your instrument as long as you sort of living it in your head um and it's like what jeremy clarkson says right no one cares if you die in a hospital bed but everyone's going to talk about it if you die in a fiery car crash right so it's live live your life like an anecdote uh, and sort of and 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 die in one too Uh, if if all goes well that's uh, quite some food for thought i would say for everyone um i'm actually we're close to 2 hours and our insta feed's going to shut down soon so <clears throat> one thing that uh, some of the uh, we're getting some requests for you to share some of your music recommendations uh, anything that has inspired you or something that resonates with you so i if you'd want to I think one way of doing this would be, you know, if you want to create a list or something and put it on the social media, um, you know, on your page, on our page, whichever way. Or if you have any songs that you'd like to recommend right now. Well, um, I'll put. I'll, there's there's way, way too many, and all for different reasons. So I can, I can, um, I can put out a list, and that we can share on, you know, on <clears throat> each of our. Each of our Instagram things. I don't know how to do it, but I'll 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 figure it out, or you guys figure it out. And <laughs> we have to do it. And um, uh, but definitely listen to. I mean, what's going on to, for in today's day and age? You sh- everyone should listen to Queen's Rikes Operation Mind Crime, and I think everyone has to listen to this Finnish guitar player called Mika Tiska. M I K A T Y S K K A. I mean, if you search for him. He's also called Mr. Fast Finger. I think that's like the happiest, most pleasant music I've heard. Uh, and the third, of course, is Bumblefoot. Bumblefoot was the guitar player for Guns N' Roses for a short while, and but he's one of the most phenomenal talents you'll ever hear. Uh, he's released a new single uh, during the shutdown or during the lockdown. So uh, one should listen to that. I mean, but but I'll give out a list for people who are interested. Um, was there anything else you were asking me about that? Uh, yeah, the for the music, there is definitely that. I'm just going to check if there's something on Instagram. If we have any more questions, um, I think we're sorted. Brain, would you like to add anything before we close the session for today? Maybe on the selection of music, there's a very interesting chap from Russia. I think he's a he's uh, originally a uh, from Israel. Maybe you have heard him. Um, he plays also the the acoustic guitar. and um, started as a and that is very interesting with many musicians um, like with architects also you s- he started from the footpath and he had to gather his money um, like you know passing on the hat and uh, that's how he enabled to travel from one place to the other place um, i'm not getting his name but very very attractive man with long hair and long beard from russia and he's played together jam together on a record in hungary with on a album that's called the the 
the flight of a butterfly. Flight of the bumblebee. No, butterfly. This time it was oh. butterfly. Must oh, watch. Must watch. Don't miss it. There are there are people who are experimenting a lot with different music instruments and discovering actually by jamming with each other new possibilities how to use a music instrument, uh, especially engaging their body along with the music instrument. And certainly these people are highly influenced by uh, by travels to India because India is presently and has been always, I think, a large pool for inspiring people. Uh, it could be uh, the 60s for Beatles. Uh, it could be much later and I think it's still happening. It's still happening um, largely. We don't come to know, but I think with the new uh, social media and the YouTube, there are many possibilities of just randomly. And, and that's what I liked also about Akshat's answer. You can't, and that's for Ritima, yes. You can't equate one with the other. I mean, in his talk today, <clears throat> sorry, in his talk today, it comes, of course, uh, very clearly true that he is a man who treads an unknown path and tries to explore on that path new and discovers new, new, new uh, materials, new ideas uh, through his observation. I know him. I know him. He's worked uh, uh, with me for more than six years, and I know he's a hands-on guy. And uh, he, I'm very sure he can make a, one day his own guitar. He can construct, a, he can craft a guitar. I'm very sure he, maybe he has done it meanwhile. And uh, that shows already his uh, dexterity and his uh, passion for doing things. And doing is, I think, by, like he said, you have to do it and observe it. What does it do to you? What does it do to your larger environment? So don't shy away from taking risks. Because after all, you don't lose anything. You stand to gain always. And I think today's talk is uh, more about that, that he dives into it. After all, it's only cold water. But you will learn by the end. And I think he, he is doing well there. He's doing good. That's all I can add. <laughs> I've been lucky. <laughs> but you yes, make your luck. That, yeah. I think, so. I think part of his you're doing, your, your factor of taking the plunge. Yes. I hope our uh, audience on Instagram heard that because I, I will not be able to repeat everything that Vinay just said. <laughs> 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 but um, Akshat, any last parting words? No, I would like to share your, your nickname and with Timas too. Uh, like yeah, to we'll, we'll cancel the call before that happens. But um, <laughs> You can mute him best. Vinay <laughs> <laughs> suggests that we mute our speaker. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, but I actually, I want to take this opportunity to thank you. You, oh, damn it. Sorry, we've just uh, lost our feed on Instagram again. Yeah. Right, there you go. Okay, so Akshat's yeah. back. Uh, this time he's back from his personal account. So in case anybody wants to switch from architecture to sprint to this to follow us, please do that. Um, okay, so, well, I lost my train of thought a little bit, but um, I think we've been, we've been having the chat for two hours now and it's been really wonderful. Um, I'm pretty sure we can go on for a longer time, but we are going to wrap up tonight. I want to thank, um, first of all, thank Mantra for having this and for facilitating this entire series of conversations. They've been interesting. And um, Akshat, thank you for taking out your time for- Thanks sharing your stories and for being rather candid about and honest about yourself and your journey. Uh, we really appreciate that. And like I said earlier, this is not about works and, and projects, but this is really about what makes all of that happen and what informs that is the person that you are. And um, I think this gives us, I hope everybody got the insight into the man dressed in black, um, not only as an architect and a designer, but as a guitarist, as somebody who has very, very intense passions for the things that he does. And um, I think the, the perhaps a little peek into the softer side of Akshat Bhatt. So thanks a lot for being here with us. And um, I thank you all for, the, for 
our audience on Zoom and on Instagram for joining us for our second Unplugged Live Talks with Matra. So thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank and, you. Uh,